This is a production of Cornell University. <clears throat> thank you, uh, thank you, Vinny, for uh, the introduction. Thank you, Franny, for uh, the invitation. Uh, and indeed, uh, it's, uh, I'm very grateful to Vinay um, and Alan Laxo, who um, have uh, given me a very interesting context to think about uh, for these last five years, uh, grounded some of our uh, uh, naive ideas about uh, plant physiology and its relation to engineering. Um, and so it's nice to be here um, and see uh, more of the faces of horticulture uh, at Cornell. So um, I'm going to tell you about models, models of transport processes in xylem and phloem. And uh, as I wrote in my abstract, these are both mathematical models and physical models. Uh, no plants, though. No, no plant models. Uh, but we'll try to make connections uh, to what is observed in plants. And I'm, I have questions uh, for you about what might or might not be observed in, uh, and observable and what might be interesting questions to pose with these models. And so this is uh, 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 the work of a large number of people in the group, a, a former postdoc, Dave Sessoms. Vinay, who's about to finish and go off to start his own lab. Olivier uh, Vincent, who's a current postdoc. Uh, Michael Santiago, uh, here in the audience, uh, a, a PhD student in uh, mechanical engineering. Eric Huber, another uh, PhD in mechanical engineering. And Jean Comte, who was a summer student who worked uh, with me and with uh, Bob Turgeon on the first uh, example I'm going to speak to you about. <clears throat> so um, first I want to say that we were inspired by plants. Um, and I was, I was just uh, telling Neil that uh, uh, as you look at a plant, you actually see an engineering system. Uh, you see the engineering processes. There's quite a lot of translation that has to be done. But once that translation is done, uh, a lot of the uh, processes from the molecular through the macroscopic map onto uh, chemical engineering in particular. Um, and so we've been interested in uh, transpiration and the kind of material science of what makes transpiration process possible. I'm going to speak to you about, uh, very briefly, about a question about regulating flow in the xylem um, and, and more in more detail about uh, sugar translocation, the phloem loading process, and then show you a, a physical and mathematical model of uh, what, uh, how failure occurs and how failure is coupled within the complex architecture of the, of the xylem, um, and then point to, for example, recovery as an open uh, challenge for us and for plant science uh, to consider. So why, well, how do I get money for this, I guess is important. Uh, well, it, that in fact, um, plants do things that we don't do or we don't do well. Um, and so, for example, the transpiration process, if it could be uh, coupled into the right materials, could be the basis for a heat transfer system, a heat transfer technology that would be uh, extendable out to uh, building scale, vehicle scale, um, and could be very valuable. And the Air Force pays us to look at uh, questions about how to use liquids under tension in the context of heat transfer. Uh, you've heard from Vinay and from Alan Laxo about uh, uh, the, a microtechnology that uh, could be a basis for communicating with plants uh, by uh, measuring water potentials, uh, by controlling liquids in the way that plants control liquids. Um, a topic that we're just beginning with a new student is the, 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 the extraordinary uh, process that uh, plants use to live in uh, with their roots uh, outside of the water table, to be able to extract the pure liquid water that they need to live from subsaturated soils. So that's a kind of truly magical seeming process from an engineer's point of view, a type of reverse, reverse osmosis that we simply don't do. And it would be very nice if we could. So I'm going to tell you today, though, about uh, our thinking this, uh, about uh, plant processes. And I'll try to keep it in the plant context as much as possible. And in particular, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk first about down, about getting uh, the, the loading process. And this is a topic that I pursued with uh, Bob Turgeon. And you'll see that he is, uh, has a very strong imprint on this field and on our particular question. Um, and then about uh, very briefly about questions of uh, local control of permeability that may be part of manipulating flow within the xylem. And finally, this uh, question of cavitation in uh, mimics of uh, xylem, the uh, segmented structure of uh, the xylem tissue. So I'm going to jump right into uh, phloem loading. 
and um, give you an overview here from, with a, a cartoon from, from Bob's uh, publication of, uh, a few years ago of Bob that reviews the ideas of symplastic passive loading where uh, it's a purely diffusive process uh, with continuous synthesis generates a gradient in concentration diffusing into the inter what, an intermediary cell in the, in the uh, sieve elements and uh, pulling in water and driving flow. A, a, a version, a kind of hybrid active passive process, which is quite intriguing that I believe is Bob's in invention, his baby, is uh, the trap, a trapping mechanism where uh, biological energy is expended in the middle of a passive process to uh, presumably increase uh, the gradient of s in sucrose concentration and in improve uh, translocation rates, for example. And finally, a familiar, one of the, I think the, the most familiar active process where you have a uh, ATP, ATPase actually pumping, again, directly using the mechanical or chemical energy to uh, uh, invert this gradient and drive uh, um, translocation. And so this is um, one of the signatures that Bob and others use uh, of something other than passive, is that uh, a passive species is obliged to bring sucrose concentration or photosynthate more generally concentrations high everywhere in the mesophyll uh, in order to drive this uh, concentration gradient, to drive passive diffusion. Um, whereas uh, these two active mechanisms have a way of segregating uh, sugars to uh, avoid having the entire leaf bathed in <coughs> high concentrations of photosynthate. And one of the, one of the important ideas of, that motivates the, uh, is the thinking about loading and loading strategies is the idea you don't want your leaves with excessive uh, photosynthate concentrations because it leaves you as an attractive uh, leafy green thing to eat uh, for species. And I'm sure there are other ideas um, out there, but that's the one that's caught um, and stuck in my mind. And so in general, this uh, ma active mechanisms uh, minimize the photosynthate concentrations and uh, should, although it's hard to get direct evidence, uh, change the translocation rate or the export loading rate. So I'm going to show you some uh, uh, recent uh, work or relatively recent work from the Turgeon lab where they, uh, I think, get the most convincing picture of this polymer trapping process. And so here we have a, uh, this enzyme that is going to do a so-called polymerization or, or oligomerization of the sucrose to create, in particular, stachyose, uh, a four-sugar uh, four um, species, um, and somehow keep it segregated here and uh, influence translocation. And so this is an example where they, uh, the Turgeon group uh, identified the, uh, the, uh, one of the players in this uh, oligomerization process and was able to knock it down. And what we see here is that uh, indeed uh, <coughs> this, uh, this species is a, a polymerizer, oligomerizer, has significantly more of these uh, raffinose family uh, oligosaccharides in the leaves than a passive loader, which has essentially none, or and they successfully knock down this oligomerization. And the consequences of this were that um, the, uh, the knockdown case uh, failed to get rid of all that uh, photosynthesis uh, and ended up with these very high concentrations of the classic passive loader. Okay? And further, this uh, had consequences on the global health of this uh, knockdown uh, case. So this is a strong suggestion that uh, this oligomerization process is part of uh, <coughs> improving the translocation efficiency, allowing the plant to drive export without building up excessive uh, concentrations of uh, photosynthetic product. I'd also note, I don't have it on the slide, but that uh, they, they nicely demonstrated in this paper that these, uh, these enzymes were localized in the um, so-called intermediary cell um, or uh, companion cell of the phloem. Uh, so the phenomenon, again, for this uh, particular loading process is that it's symplastic, unlike active, the classic active process. It goes through uh, plasma desmata. Uh, it's, uh, it has this enzymatic conversion, which you can think of as a kind of a bootstrap. It's, it seems like a bootstrapping uh, 
process on top of a passive mechanism. We're putting in energy in an odd place in this pump. Um, it has this segregation, characteristic segregation of sugars in the intermediary cell and uh, appears to have more efficient translocation. So the questions are, we'd like to build a model uh, that would couple to water relations, and I'm going to emphasize that I think it's crucial that you couple to the, to all the way to the xylem to think about how loading occurs. So this, this uh, we have to add ingredients over here in terms of coupling to the, the xylem. Um, uh, the impact of polymerization and, and segregation on rates of translocation. Uh, the, the, the relationship between, in particular, um, pumping, the ability to export efficiently, and segregate. Is this segregation part of the, uh, the mode of operation of this trapping mechanism? Um, and w we can then look towards putting some constraints on what the plasma desmata must be like. Again, this is symplastic. We don't think of plasma desmata as being very specific pore proteins that have the ability to select between two small molecules like uh, sucrose and uh, stachyose, uh, but here they, they seem to be. And so we can be good to think about what a plasma desmata in this particular class of plasma desmata must look like. So we, uh, with guidance from Bob, uh, took uh, images like this showing intermediary cell mesophyll and, and phloem, and this being the, the, the special membrane that contains these a special uh, plasma desmata, um, and we built a, a, a new cartoon inspired by Bob's original cartoon, but in, in particular has particular additional ingredients like being coupled to the xylem at a well-defined, uh, typically negative water potential. Okay, and here we have the potential to be drawing in water directly into the mesophyll uh, <coughs> and water into the intermediary cell where the um, enzyme is a. Uh, processing the sucrose into oligomers, with the eventual possibility that this is not, which you wouldn't expect it to be, a perfect osmotic membrane to select between sucrose and uh, stachyose. Okay. And so we're gonna, this has uh, hydraulics in it. It's, got, uh, it's gonna have flows, uh, there will be flow speeds, there's gonna be these fees. The, eventually, I'm not gonna uh, have them out explicitly, but we're gonna d get to some reflection coefficients, effective reflection coefficients for this uh, plasmid desmal membrane that's acting like an osmotic membrane. Uh, we're going to account for uh, diffusion. I'm going to run. I'm going to run the enzymatic kinematics at zeroth order, v max. Okay. We can do this with full Michaelis menten but I'm going to run it uh, at zeroth order. And then we are keeping track of stachyose, sucrose, uh, and uh, this uh, concentration of enzyme is embedded in this enzymatic rate. So just to rem remind you again that underneath everything I'm going to show you, we have a hydraulic, very a simple but a hydraulic architecture of these two components of the leaf uh, with a plasma desmal membrane, each coupled to the xylem, and then coupled down to an, uh, an unloading zone somewhere in the root or a fruit or somewhere else. We're going to keep this very simple. In fact, we're going to just say that unloading is not limiting. Uh, we're going to keep the unloading, the root pressure, in some sense, in the flow is going to be zero. It's going to be easy to unload, but it's uh, putting in loading limitations is is a possibility. So, what is what is uh, the Munch mechanism? Go back to the beginning. Passive mechanism is the Munch hypothesis, um, <coughs> and we're going to so we're going to start by uh, a reduced version of our model that uh, we, right now uh, this is just the passive. Uh, it's passive because I don't have any enzymes in here. And I'm going to, uh, for now, uh, just, keep, uh, just allow sucrose to passively diffuse across this membrane, not allow water to be loaded into the mesophyll. Um, and think about the, uh, what controls the concentration of sucrose that uh, pulls in water and drives the munch, the munch pump. Okay? <coughs> and so, uh, this is the, the four equations. Those are all there'll be. There are four unknowns here. I need to know the flow rates of sucrose, the flow rate of, uh, of sucrose and of water, uh, concentration uh, in the uh, intermediary cell. And I'll just point out that in these uh, cu coupled equations, there is the classic Munch process, which is to say there is sucrose getting to this uh, pocket that's coupled to the water potential. We have to have an osmotic strength that can overcome the water potential. Um, 
and a piece that isn't often considered is that uh, I'm going to emphasize is this conservation of sucrose. Is that this the same thing that's, uh, that Munch is trying to give you, which is flow to carry your sucrose, is sweeping away your concentration gradient so that the concentration that's driving that osmotic process is inversely proportional to the flow that it's creating. Okay, so there's that coupling that is, is, is crucial in uh, closing the Munch process. And in fact, what it, uh, it we, Jean uh, Conté, who uh, built this model, uh, identified a dimensionless group, and this is one of the things that uh, we do in our, our field, is to try to group the parameters in a way that uh, uh, characterizes a process, and in particular, this uh, loss of concentration due to the water flow is a competition between the flow of water and the diffusive flow of sugar. And it can be write, written like this. Uh, it's got the permeabilities, the hydraulic permeabilities, a characteristic difference in pressure. Um, this is a negative number. Uh, it's being overcome by this osmotic number. And this is a, a, diffusi a diffusive uh, coefficient, a diffusion, uh, a diffusion coefficient for this membrane, a, a so-called mass transfer coefficient. And so this captures the impact of tra uh, convection on the trapping process. And I'm going to show that it, it's, a useful, it's a useful number to have. So here's a case where we're going to consider that the plant has a desired turgor, say, in its mesophyll. It keeps the uh, levels of sucrose in the mesophyll at a constant level. And we're going to ask, what happens when I turn on the reaction rate? The uh, uh, Q-polymerization is going to be a homogeneous reaction rate turning uh, sucrose into stachyose. And so uh, first, I'm going to turn on the polymerization with uh, a low, a low uh, flow. Uh, in fact, this is a high flow permeability. I have this backward. Um, so that there's lots of flow. Our so-called flushing number is bigger than one. And what we find is that absolutely we benefit from the, the trapping mechanism. By consuming, I'm, gonna, I'm going to the extreme where uh, the enzymes are fast enough that I use up all the sucrose it diffuses across. And of course, in the Munch picture, here the red line being the concentration of all of sucrose uh, uh, between the mesophyll and the intermediary cell, if I use up all the sucrose, I absolutely improve the rate at which I move sucrose into the flow. Okay? So trapping with high flow rate, low flow rate, it does, it, it's definitely going to improve or polymerization, let's say, oligomerization, will definitely improve uh, the rate of uh, export relative to no, no oligomerization. But uh, it, there's no se segregation in this case. I'm getting rid of all of the photosynthate that gets into the intermediary cell before it can pile up. Okay? So here we have a polymer without trapping. Okay, and it is useful, but it doesn't. It's it, this. I'm showing you Apple on a so-called purely passive loader. If I turn it on, on the other hand, in the presence of a large resistance, here I have this. I was thinking resistance here, a, a small permeability for the rest of the transport flow. Uh, I get both. I I can use up all my sucrose, drive more diffusion, uh, higher loading rates, but also if I'm not flushing it away too quickly, I can end up with segregation and uh, characteristic this type of picture of the, the loading and segregation of the photosynthate into the uh, phloem elements. So this just, uh, this, we've looked at this in a variety of scenarios. Here I'm, I'm just showing uh, the ratio, this is looking at segregation, the ratio of intermediary cell concentration total of all sugars. Uh, versus in the mesophyll as a function of the, this, the flow rate, uh, the non-dimensional flow rate. And we see that we, get, we, can, we can get very large uh, segregation, but we can also uh, have polymerization going on without any, uh, without any segregation here, uh, mesophyll concentration below um, intermediary cell. On the other hand, and this is, I think, an important conclusion from this model, under any circumstance here, uh, increasing the polymerization rate increases the equivalent sucrose export rate. Okay? It is always a good idea to polymerize, all right? whether you segregate or not. Okay? And I'll just say briefly that we, this, I've, I've shown this in the, the simplest case, but if we go back to a full connection 
full water relations, in a sense, and uh, the possibility of having intermediate uh, reflection coefficients for this plasmadesimal membrane, uh, these same trends hold. And these are almost identical looking plots that, uh, and the, 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 we, we, our, our understanding right now is that localized polymerization always is beneficial from the point of view of export, but does not depend on segregation. So this, this is a question for Bob, why segregate? Okay. And I'm going to tell you in just the next few slides, segregate is not trivial. You've got to build, you've got to turn these plasma desmond into an osmotic membrane. So why, there, there, it, it seems to suggest that there's some other reason uh, to segregate that doesn't have to do with improving the rate of, uh, of, of export. Okay. Now, so that's something that we've been discussing, we need to continue to discuss, but I'll be interested in if there are any uh, suggestions. So one interesting uh, idea that emerged from uh, Jean's model is, and, and here uh, Bob pulled together this set of data uh, showing that uh, a lot of plat passive loaders, in particular trees, which surprisingly you'd think trees are always classified, the big guys who have to export over meters and meters and meters are all passive. Okay? But they do polymerize, oligomerize. They oligomerize, they don't segregate. But what Jean has shown in this model is that any polymerization is good polymerization. You're taking away that sucrose, increasing that gradient, and so there's some possibility that these guys are another version of uh, pol uh, pol uh, polymer trappers uh, that take advantage of the increased translocation efficiency without uh, worrying about segregation. So I'm going to um, come now just finish with uh, this topic with questions about the plasma desmida. So I've, I've alluded to this, that it's not obvious. We usually think of plasma desmida as being big, big pores, OK? Um, many molecules across. So how are we distinguishing between a sucrose and a stachyose, which a, re a reasonable hydraulic d dimension of a, su of a sucrose would be one nanometer, and a stachyose just 1.4 in diameter. Okay, so and this is a micrograph of the, the special type of plasma desma that are found in these uh, in these trappers, uh, but it's still a pretty big structure. And of course, we're thinking about this as an annular lumen. We're thinking about a, a substructure, but it's it's not easy to see how you get a selectivity based on that. So we're going to try to build a, a simple model. And this is partly to check an idea that Bob uh, first mentioned to us in our first conversation, which is that partly this could be hydrodynamic selectivity. Okay? Once we're going to uh, have a pressure gradient, uh, a water potential gradient in particular, between the, uh, the mesophyll and the intermediary cell, and this is going to drive a convective flow through that same pore through which sucrose and stachyose are trying to diffuse. Sucrose is going to be going with the flow. Stachyos is going to be go trying to diffuse against the flow. So to the extent that you can bootstrap this system and get it going, it's, it's going to be tending to give you the selectivity. It's going to be tending to exclude stachyos from back diffusing. And that's what this uh, first, uh, this is for a, the very generic diffusion and convection Pozoi flow through a pipe uh, appropriate for macro scale. Uh, what it says is that even if we have no, absolutely no mechanism for selectivity, uh, we can, for the guys who are trying to back diffuse, uh, we can uh, get to a, um, a ratio, there's a, there'll be a ratio of the pore size to the solute size at which you will go from uh, back diffusion to convective uh, uh, expulsion of the stachyos. Okay? Uh, uh, so this is a purely hydrodynamic, convection-based mechanism by which you could have this apparent selectivity and segregation. Now we've gone on, there are, uh, we've picked the simplest uh, model to take into account essentially just sterics of the pore with a, a dimension R and a solute that has a dimension that's not far from R. And what we find is, it, and this impacts, as R changes, uh, it impacts both the solvent and the solute. And what we can find is uh, at very small ratios of pore to solute, so saying that the pore is just 
a, a 1.5 fold what the uh, solute is, we can find that in also that this steric selectivity, steric reflection coefficient, can give us uh, a, 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 a inhibit backflow of the stachyos. And, um, and interestingly, this same model of hindered, so-called hindered transport by Dean et al, uh, actually at very large pore sizes, again, gi can give us a purely convective uh, uh, mechanism for selectivity. So this, I'm going to summarize our, our, the findings of this in, in this uh, state diagram. I'm bringing back our flushing parameter, keeping track of the importance of convection uh, through, the, through from the xylem to the phloem, um, and keeping track of one non-dimensional geometrical piece of information, the pore size to the uh, solute size. And these are for these boundaries are these are these lines are boundaries between a, a, a huge sea of non-segregating cases and a very small set of parameters that give us segregation. And this is what I mean by it's not it's not easy to segregate. To segregate uh, with a with in the presence of uh, with this hindered transport model, you have to be at very low through flow rates of water, and very small ratios of the pore to the solute size. Okay, so if uh, we take an, a typical ratio of stachyose to sucrose of 1.4, uh, the pore has to just be a couple nanometers uh, across. Okay, and let me just remind you that the pore is not. It, this is a, a picture that uh, Bob pointed us to of this annular region with uh, obstructions in the form of proteins, okay, that are coming, the, the, the plasma desmo uh, has two membranes, it's this annular region that's free, and the, these, what we can think of as nanochannels, and not just microchannels, uh, pass in, passing in between this obstacle course of protruding proteins, all right? It's, as far as we know, this is about how well we understand that architecture. Okay, this blurry transmission electron micrograph. Okay. What we're pointing to here is that within that blur, if we're gonna if we're gonna see uh, if we're gonna see uh, segregation, we're gonna be at these uh, those effective openings between those proteins are gonna be very small indeed. I'll just point out that uh, uh, if we avoid hindrance, uh, we can, purely convective segregation can occur but only for unrealistically large differences in the size of the two solutes. Okay? We can open up another region where segregation occurs, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it would seem to be, it's pointing again to the need for some sort of selectivity. At this point, I'm putting it into the difference in size of the two, these two molecules, uh, which is uh, not uh, realistic. So, um, so and to summary, it, it summarize, I think, you don't have to go far uh, in terms of building a model in, in, uh, on top of Munch uh, type ideas, but you do need to bring in water relations. You do need to bring in the xylem. You do need to bring in the convection that is the through convection that is uh, from the xylem down into the transport flow. Uh, importantly, oligomerization uh, is always a good idea if you're a passive loader with some plastic pads. It always makes sense to do that. Um, and, and maybe a bunch of passive loaders that we have not been thought of in this way or in fact taking the advantage of this. On the other hand, uh, segregation is, is a mystery from my point of view right now. Bob's going to have to explain it to me. Uh, and that uh, finally, their plasma desmina in some sense can be brought down to a scale where they act like a pore protein, like a selective pore protein. Um, and to do that, uh, you not surprisingly have to get down to a molecular scale. Um, now, right now, we have a, essentially a billiard ball kind of model of transport through a plasma desmata, but uh, it points to the, uh, the, the need, in particular, you can't just have convective selectivity. You do need some what is essentially a chemical-like selectivity in that plasma desmata membrane. So uh, I'll be happy, to, are there any questions right now? I'm just going to speed ahead. Okay, so I'm just going to go very briefly through an idea that uh, we explored with Michael Santiago and Vinay uh, uh, that is a, 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 an observation in the literature that uh, the border pit membranes uh, change their permeability um, as a function of the co composition of, this, of, of the xylem sap. And 
One proposal for why they might be doing this is, is that the plant could actually be modifying the composition of the xylem sap to change the permeability of its xylem and direct flows within the xylem tissue, conductive tissue, to deal with, for example, gradients in uh, composition of the soil, water potential, uh, thermal gradients. And so this is a classic, uh, this is an observation of Martin Zimmerman in the, in the 70s. Uh, it was followed up by uh, uh, Machik and Machik Zwinecki and uh, Missy Holbrook uh, 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 a little over 10 years ago and very cleanly showed that uh, uh, with respect to ionic strength, uh, millimolars of ionic strength, the permeability of xylem tissue, which is supposed to be this passive conduit, in fact, uh, changes. Okay, and uh, in, for example, resistance goes down as ionic strength goes up. Uh, resistance goes down with that pH going down. So we're coupling to some chemical characteristics of the uh, xylem, and in this work, an important piece of this work is that they isolated passage through an individual border pit membrane and showed that this remained true. And so they uh, pinpointed the border pit membrane as the source of this variability. Uh, they had a very clean story. They got into science. You know, that, uh, that's, you have to have a clean story. Uh, since then, the story is not so clean. In particular, Koshar and many others have found that they, there are species in which the, this so-called ion effect is backwards, zero, uh, and so on. And so um, what we're seeing, just to clarify, what we're seeing here is the, uh, the, the, the flow rate, and here a normalized flow rate with respect to the uh, the uh, uh, zero ionic strength case. So I'm just going to point out that, and we, you can see this in the paper uh, that we just came out, that uh, we looked at um, an explanation of this based on uh, the uh, uh, what's so-called electrokinetic phenomenon. And I'm pointing this out partly to r remind you or make you aware of the fact that there are electric fields in plants during transpiration. Okay? Why? Well, because uh, plant tissues are charged. Essentially all tissues, all materials are charged in the presence of water. Plant tissues are going to be negative because of uh, carboxylic uh, acid groups in particular. Uh, and as you convect through uh, a, a, a pore, for example, through, through the, the uh, border pit membrane, um, you're going to carry the counter ions that are associated with the charged tissue from one end to the other that you're going to lead to a polarization in the electrolyte. That is going to create an electric field. And in the, what we're looking at here, the so-called electroviscous effect, that electric field actually drives a net flow back and reduces the amount of total flow you get for a given pressure difference across the uh, system. Okay? And so uh, but I think it's worth, whether this is important to any of you or to anybody, this particular electroviscous effect, I don't know, but we could have tens of millivolts, maybe 100 millivolts voltage difference over very small distances within the xylem. And of course, that's the polarization of a, of a plasma membrane. So there's the potential to actually, uh, uh, for, for these electrical effects coupled to flow to be part of, for example, signaling. So I'll just show that. Um, this model, there's a, there's a big uh, cloud we, we reduced somewhat of, from the literature on these effects, but and taking the ones that had a, a large range of the relative permeability uh, for a, the, the charged channel versus an uncharged channel um, uh, as a function of ionic strength. And what we took here, our, our predictions are this dotted line and this solid line. This is the lowest range, end of the range of surface charge that we could find be, to be reasonable for tissues in the xylem and on the border pits. This is the high end of the range uh, of, 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 of surface potentials or surface charge densities. And what we see is that uh, a reasonable part of this cloud fits our uh, predictions. And one important aspect of our predictions is that it's non-monotonic, this electroviscous effect. As we lower ionic strength into the tens of millimolar range, uh, the, electro, uh, the, the, the viscosity uh, grows, we have lower permeability, and then it plateaus and rises up slightly again as we go towards the ionized water. Okay? Uh, the, 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 and so we, what we can conclude from this is not that this is the, 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 the mechanism for electroviscous effect, or for the ion effect, but that it absolutely uh, is going to be present, whether 
whether it's dominant or not. Okay? We propose some experiments that can distinguish them, and we're hoping uh, we or someone else is going to do them. But I think, again, uh, the, the bottom line is that there are certainly uh, effects possible for electric fields in xylem tissue, um, and they could be part of uh, uh, signaling, potentially part of a refilling process, or uh, translocation. Okay. So I'm going to finish with um, our, our synthetic models of, of plants. And so this is what we, we some simple structure like this we, we call a tree. Uh, and uh, it's got two, two zones where it can exchange with the outside world. Uh, if it's a, a, a zone that is, is wetter, we'll call the root. A zone that's drier, we'll call the leaf. And then we're, we're moving this into silicon uh, uh, so that, for example, we can uh, measure things quantitatively about the state of water in this system. And so we can start putting in architectural features like the segmented quality of xylem. Um, and so uh, uh, I'll first tell you, uh, give you a little update on what vinay has been up to and tell you uh, about one version of this synthetic tree is we call a tensiometer. And uh, essentially, it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a leaf coupled to uh, a pressure transducer. And uh, are the context that Vinay has told you about is that this is what a tensiometer is called. Is, is called a tensiometer today. We'd like one that to extend the range of function by several orders of magnitude and uh, the form factor so that, for example, this can become an embeddable technology. And so uh, the key to this, and this is what we, is to find materials that can act like the mesophyll uh, and it's in relation to transpiration. And in particular, hold on to uh, water with a, 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 a meniscus that uh, has very high radius of curvature, very small radius of curvature, uh, order a few nanometers um, so that we can get to capillary pressure differences between the liquid and the gas outside of uh, tens to hundreds of uh, megapascals. So um, this all, we've, by going into silicon, we can also build uh, transducers uh, direct to get electrical signals as a function of stress. And uh, these can be uh, these are very well uh, behaved mechanical systems that give us simple signal and can be calibrated uh, 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 against uh, uh, well defined pressures. And uh, the kind of uh, one of the exciting things that's the first results to come out of this is to truly visualize water at stresses well beyond what's believed to occur in, in, in the, uh, the plant world. And so this is an example of a calibrated device where here's the voltage across this uh, sensor and here's the, uh, the pressure across this sensor. And here's one where Vinay just put it on the bench and allowed it to dry into a very dry atmosphere. And uh, much to our pleasure, uh, it failed, but it failed at over 300 bars, okay, over 30 megapascals. And so we think this, in, in any context of creating liquids under tension, this is the largest negative pressure that has ever been measured. Uh, and certainly in, uh, in the context of plant, a plant-like mechanism of a porous membrane coupling to a low water potential, this is uh, a strong uh, support of Dixon and Jolie and Ashkenazi and all the others who put forward uh, uh, co cohesion tension theory over 100 years ago. Uh, it's kind of one of the nice things I'll show you a, a few times of in, in such a system is that we can also watch the consequences of tension. And so this is, this is one of these uh, pockets of liquid uh, during the moment when failure occurs. And what you can see here is uh, dramatically the, the e extremely violent uh, event that cavitation or embolization is. Okay, so this is, uh, what you see is that a, a turbulent flow is, uh, emerges in a 25 micron gap that's a few millimeters wide here. We can also see, uh, for, for better or for worse, this is violent enough that it starts to actually damage our silicon and glass structure. Okay? Uh, around the edge, it starts to debond. And so that's a, one of the a nice opportunities. Uh, in terms of being useful, uh, this, this is uh, the anomaly. This over 300 bars is an anomaly. But we actually have uh, on uh, some 15, 20 runs with running these things to their stability limit, we, they all go to over 10 megapascals. Okay? So it gives a, a sense of uh, a, a new technology to couple the plant. In the laboratory, they're starting to be very well behaved. And this is uh, 
work of Michael Santiago. In fact, what this gives us is a new, a, a new measure of the thermodynamics of water under tension, which has only been measured along, uh, in fact, this isotherm. And what we can see is that uh, our calibrated tensiometer agrees with the equation of state, the international equation of state uh, at 20 degrees. There's important questions about the international equation of state of water as you go to cooler temperatures, and that's one of the opportunities. Uh, Vinny actually just uh, got one of these into soil from the Veness lab, and what you can see is he got a tensiometer that's going to nine bars in a drying soil, uh, which is, again, showing that we're now at a, a completely different regime for tensiometry uh, than is currently accessible. I'll also point out it wasn't fast. It was a slow experiment. And that is one of the uh, challenges that we uh, can, can address uh, within this format by changing the geometry of this uh, system. So I'll just point out, I, we are interested in people with large stress questions, OK? Deserts, OK? Uh, trees. We would like uh, excuses to be going to 100 bars uh, in the soil or in your plant. So let us know. So I'm going to finish with uh, the questions about failure, about cavitation and how it occurs. And I'm going to point to this, this, this nice meta-analysis across many studies that shows, uh, surprisingly, how many species live right at their 50% uh, loss of conductivity line. Okay? Uh, and even those that don't, they live at some 50, uh, 25 percent of loss conductivity, which says that plants every single day are, are embolizing, cavitating, and recovering. Um, and very recently in this room, we saw uh, um, the group from Davis tell us about direct visualization of embolisms within uh, xylem vessels, and uh, even more intriguingly, refilling in real time within uh, vessels. Uh, one of the, of course, we're not all lucky enough to have Lawrence Berkeley Lab across the street. And uh, what most people do, including Vinay with Alan Laxo uh, and Taryn up in Geneva, is to measure uh, acoustically a non-invasive method, method of getting information out about uh, the uh, failure modes within the xylem tissue. And so this is just a collection on grapevine of the number of acoustic events versus water potential uh, in a vine. Um, and interestingly, uh, what would be nice is if we could do, learn more from these non-invasive techniques. Is there some way to do statistics and learn about the dynamics in such a way that we could do the inverse problem? We get the sound, we hear it. Uh, can we learn about the local architecture that created it Okay, and the dynamics that created it? So for example, in this data, what we'll see is that there are times when it pulses. Okay? There'll be huge events, and then nothing, and then huge events, and then nothing. Interesting also, there's a power law distribution in event sizes, like avalanches or stock market crashes. There's some uh, interesting dynamics that defines the size of these events. So uh, one of the things that we've been doing with this uh, synthetic system is to create these segmented architecture where we have here uh, vessel elements uh, coupled through the same nanoporous silicon uh, to other vessel elements and then coupled to the outside world where we can generate stresses by presenting low water potential. And so what we're looking at here is uh, three full cavities. Uh, one is in the midst of cavitating and then this guy's empty. Okay. And so I'm going to sh show you uh, some movies like this. Now looking from the top over a big array, and what we're doing is we're drying these out into an 85% relative humidity atmosphere. And what we were very pleased to see is that uh, we have these isolated events. Okay? This is robustness. This is the proposal, of the textbook proposal for why xylem remains segmented is so that a cavitation event doesn't spread in an uncontrolled manner along the full length of the xylem. And that, indeed, is what we see. Uh, you can uh, that the dynamics is more complicated than that. We definitely do have some propensity to dry, to cavitate more near the highest stress zones. Uh, but there's this very rough drying front that we see. And so this is surprising uh, in a physical science context. A material, if you start extracting liquid from it, you would think it should dry from the outside, where the stresses are largest. More interestingly, if you watch this, uh, 
in, in detail, what you'll see is that in fact, um, it's doing something very regular. You're, we're pulling in a steady manner, and it's responding, in fact, in a series of avalanches, uh, very uh, controlled avalanches that occur of a similar size at uh, a timing that seems to be uh, very strictly controlled by something. Okay? So uh, the, something's going on to couple these uh, failure events. All right? And this just shows that th these correlations of this time trail of, of avalanches goes out towards tens of minutes to an hour. Okay? Um, so one thing is that we can also hear these same events, just in fact using the same acoustic transducer that goes into the field, we can hear these events. Uh, they create a strong uh, 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 acoustic ultrasonic uh, shock. Um, uh, and in fact, it has very similar signatures to the ones that we see from woody species. Um, and so our first hypothesis was that these events are triggering each other. One, app, one cavitation event sends an acoustic signal and triggers another or another series of them. Unfortunately, though, what I show here are correlations on the scale of 10, 5, 10 minutes. The ring down of one of these acoustic events is just a millisecond. Okay? So these do have, there's interest in the fact that they create a, acoustic signals, but it can't be what's coupling these events. So we, when we went back to our data uh, and looked more closely, and in particular started to look at spatial information about these correlations, what we saw was that uh, if we plotted the position between two uh, subsequent events versus the time between those subsequent events, we actually had this uh, cloud with a very clear hole in it. Okay? That uh, within this zone, a, an event that occurs at time zero uh, inhibits the, uh, a second cavitation event in, in this, uh, for this period of time over this distance. And in fact, when we look at this envelope on this in, in inhibited zone, it in fact has a square root of time behavior that suggests uh, a, diffusive, a diffusive phenomenon. So in fact, what we think, and we're quite convinced now, is of hydraulic suppression of adjacent events. And this, I think, relates to interesting ideas about why plants uh, do go to 25, 50% of their cavitation uh, uh, possibility in a given day. And so very quickly, what, what we can write down, and this will be true for plants as well, is a diffusion equation for pressure in this medium, in the xylem tissue. Any porous medium uh, will have uh, some elasticity. In this case, in our very rigid material, it's elasticity of water and a permeability, which is its Darcy permeability. And together, these create a diffusion constant for pressure. And pressure solves the time-dependent diffusion equation. And in, in this problem, this time-dependent diffusion is coupled to the kinetics of cavitation, which is a function of the pressure that's being diffused around. Okay. And so uh, this shows what our understanding of this process is. So here, this is Eric Huber's model of those equations I just showed. And what we saw is the pressure, uh, the, the pressure uh, drop coming in from the edge, uh, creating a cavitation event in this first cavity. That then sent out a wave. Before the wave could reach it, here we, the wave is going out of suppression. These two guys cavitated. Before that suppression wave could come and meet them, they all then spread out, refill the, 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 the medium with water that's freed up, by, freed up by the cavitation event, and thus suppress further cavitation events for uh, a period of time. Okay. And so this, we believe, this is now is from this type of model of our same experiment. And we see uh, a consensually one-to-one -one match of the dynamics we get uh, in, our, in our experimental system. And when, with this uh, uh, coupled pressure diffusion uh, reaction process. And so I think what's important is that, in, and I've seen this proposed in the literature, this is an example of the xylem serving, as, the xylem water serving as a reservoir of water for the tissue that doesn't cavitate. So you have vulnerable zones, they cavitate, and they give you water to release tension in the, transiently in the rest of the, the plant. OK. So uh, I, I'll finish up uh, to connect this back. The inverse problem, we, would, we now do under, have one explanation for why we might see these periodic events in, in uh, acoustic data at times. We don't have an explanation for this power law of distribution. 
But there's a nice uh, possibility now to look at uh, other architectures, try to understand the dynamics and design criteria for, for, for xylem tissue. Um, and th what I'm showing here is, in fact, this same system will uh, refill. Uh, we have tricks to get this system to mimic refilling. And that's an opportunity to look at some of the proposals for how uh, xylem repairs. So I'll finish with these. Uh, remind you that your, your, your choice of species to study, they're excellent engineers and inspiration. Uh, there are opportunities for technologies, both to interface with plants and to go out into other places in the world. And then math that models, both mathematical and physical, like all models, are wrong, but potentially can be useful to constrain the way you think about a system that you have a, a, a lack of information on. So with that, I'd like to again acknowledge, in particular, uh, Vinay uh, and uh, Michael, Olivier, uh, Jean, and um, Eric for their uh, direct participation in, in this work. And thank you, and be happy to take any questions. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.